Joe, before before we get into some of the um, big stuff in the league, Devontae Adams, the Deshaun Watson situation, I do want to start with Washington because that's a team I cover, and you obviously know this division well. Getting Carson Wentz, I'm curious, I'll just start there. What did you think of that trade? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been critical of the trade, and I should put it in context to be fair. I mean, I was a big fan of Carson's. I thought they were smart to pick him. I thought they were smart in Philadelphia to give him the extension. And I thought he had a chance to turn things around in Indy. So I just may be totally wrong about Wentz. So. <laughs> but, um, you know, as I watched him play, what changed my mind was just his, uh, he seems to have lost his confidence. I thought maybe going back with Frank Reich would change that, but it didn't. I think you have to realize, I consider the Eagles and Colts two of the smarter front offices in the league. And the Eagles were willing to spend $30 million cap dollars to not have him on their team. I mean, that's a pretty incredibly strong statement to me about just how challenging the situation must be. Once the Colts decided to trade him, they took the same risk. Now, they got compensation, so it didn't go that way. But they could have eaten $28 million of guaranteed money rather than have him on the team. So I'm influenced by watching the tape, which I still think wasn't good last year, and the fact that what I consider to be two smart teams with smart offensive coaches decided they would rather take a huge cap hit than have him on the team. I can't just dismiss that and think there isn't some significant issues that are explaining it. Can, when you look at Wentz, knowing, watching, having watched him, and can he turn it, do you feel like there, he can turn it around? I mean, I, and you, you're right, like those are two good organizations and all that, and this team hasn't had that level of success, obviously. Do you feel like there's still hope for him to turn it around? Well, I don't want to say there's no hope. I mean, ter in terms of raw talent and the ability to make, I mean, I've been saying he he's going to make some spectacular plays. He's just going to go, wow. He's going to have some games in which you're going to believe, oh, we found the guy. I mean, that's who he is. But I believe as you put together the whole 17 games, are you going to look back and go, wow, that was the right move? Or, hey, we've got our guy for the future. At this point, I'm going to be surprised if we're saying yes to that. But listen, these are all subjective judgments. Sure. They could be wrong. They, maybe Scott Turner and Ron can find, you know, the, whatever it is that makes him tick in a way that it's, it's more successful than it's been. But if I'm looking at my crystal ball and making a prediction based on what I've seen, I, I, I'd be concerned, especially now that as we've seen what evolved, did they move too quickly once they didn't get Russell Wilson? Because, you know, if a Matt Ryan comes on the market, that would have been like the perfect answer. Um, and, and, you know, there's a couple of other things out there that could also. I mean, I, I'm actually a Mariota fan. And mm. would it be better to have him at virtually no money and no compensation or Wentz? So these are all questions that, as, we, as we've seen, to be fair, they couldn't have known this at the time. But as we've seen what's played out, could have changed the outcome. One of the things that in talking to Ron Rivera, he said that one thing that influenced him was that he got good feedback from Doug Peterson and Frank Reich. Yeah. I mean, listen, Frank Reich obviously went to bat for him. He said that publicly in Indianapolis and then was at least willing to go along with him being traded, if not, you know, being in favor of it. Um, so, you know, and, you know, Doug was still in Philly when things started to go south with, with right. Carson. So, uh, and listen, people in the league don't like bad-mouthing other people, whether it's coaches or players. I mean, these are dreams come true. These are all human beings. They all have families. Um, and I'm not saying that they weren't honest. I just think that the picture is more complex right. than what they painted. I mean, Indy, we sit here and Indy still desperately needs a quarterback. Right. So either there's some massive division in the building or Frank agrees with Chris and apparently the owner that they were better off moving on from Carson even before they had an answer as to who's next. To get the max play out of him, is it with, with Carson, is it about, um, you know, is, I don't want to say making him feel wanted because I think that's a little bit too um, basic, but like what, what does he need to be successful in your eyes? What would you do as an organization? Yeah, and this is what makes me nervous. My answer is what the Colts did last year. Have a really strong offensive line run plays where the ball gets out as quickly as you can. That's where he gets into trouble when the ball comes out late. At least have the defense know that if you want to, you can run the ball really well at any time. Those are the kinds of things that he needs to do to be successful. Um, he's not going to be the leader. He can be a leader. Okay. 
And, and that distinction is something that coach needs to be aware of from the day he comes in, because you do need player leadership to be successful in the NFL. Oftentimes that comes from a quarterback and Carson has the personality where that can be him, but he's actually been a little bit more divisive than a bring everybody together guy, maybe his fault or not. It may be fair or not, but that is the reality of the history. Um, so I would, if I were Ron, I would do those same things and uh, uh, just hope, you know, another year of kind of learning lessons, learning from mistakes, gaining experience, uh, that we could execute that even better than the Colts did. And I think that would give him the best chance to be the best he can be. When you look at the NFC East, how does he stack up with these other quarterbacks? Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> it's uh, one of the weakest quarterback divisions we've ever seen. I mean, Dak is, is very good, but he's not, I don't think he's elite. And I consider all of the other quarterbacks, people that there's questions as to whether they can even be quality starters or solid starters in the NFL. The difference here is, I think if you take like a Hertz or Daniel Jones and they're well coached, you're not going to have a great offense, but you also won't be leaving your defense in bad positions yeah. frequently. And that's where Carson, you have a real risk with Carson of that. I know his TD to interception ratio was pretty good last year, but he had some drop balls. He had some very timely mistakes that, you know, really hurt them. Um, he struggled against pressure. Um, so even though last year's numbers look good there, I still consider him a high risk as a potential high turnover quarterback. And to me, that makes him uh, more risky than the other quarterbacks, even though other than Dak, there's none of them that any of us would want to build a team around. You know Ron Rivera pretty He was in Philly with you. What, what are your yep. thoughts on him? And Juan Castillo was as well, I think, during your whole time there. So what are your thoughts on those two guys um, just as coaches? Now, I have very high regard for both of those guys. I mean, Ron was in, I mean, uh, Juan was in a slightly different role in, in uh, who he was coaching here. I mean, these are really high character people, high integrity, credible work ethic, really love the idea of teaching players. Coaches like to call themselves teachers, and those guys, you really see why they think that. I mean, I think that from that perspective, I mean, the team is in good shape. I mean, the type of leadership you need from your head coach, the ability to motivate the players, kind of being able to think kind of from a macro strategic perspective. I mean, Ron is really good at all those things. So I've said it from the day they hired him. I thought it was a very good hire. And uh, I, I think that will prove to be the case at, at the end. I think he's actually done a solid job, even though they haven't won as many games as right. we'd hope in the first two years. But for me, it's always been year three. If you're a GM or head coach, that's when, if you've been doing things right, it's going to start to really show up in year three. So this is the test. This is the year those guys, and Ron in particular, are going to have to prove that, the foundation they've been laying over the last two or three years is now starting to show on the field and we're starting to win a lot more games. From the outside, do you see that ability here? And, and I guess the other thing along with that and is for all that you say about Carson, how much of an upgrade is he? Is he enough of one to get them to a certain spot? Yeah, listen, I, I, I mean, I, again, I'm trying to be kind of <laughs> nice and not to, but I, I yeah, struggle no, to too. Yeah. I see, struggle to see Carson being able to lead them to that next level. But, you know, that's where we'll see. They obviously disagree with that. And the raw talent, he's outstanding. Um, but if they're going to do it, I think they're going to do it with a little bit more conservative offense than what Carson's been in and with a really aggressive defense and kind of play the game in a more conservative, some may say more old-fashioned way. Um, and that would give them the best chance. And, and again, the division is still weak. I mean, I do think the teams are improving, but the division is still weak. So to rule anybody out at this point would be a mistake. Also, when you're building a team, how important during free agency is this second, I guess, the so-called second wave? And what would be your philosophy toward building a team during, you know, with, I guess, the free agency period and how you would handle? Yeah, listen, this, the second wave is a, uh, there, there are a few areas in football, even with the uh, increased amount of movement and trade and use of analytics and all this kind of stuff. There are a couple of markets in the NFL that are still very inefficient. And by that, I mean, there are good opportunities to find players that can make a difference without a lot of cost. So um, and this is one of them. I mean, there was a stretch where I think it was five or six years in a row. A, uh, there was at least one player in the top 10 in getting sacks who was a veteran player who had signed late in free agency for not very much money. So just think about that top 10. I mean, we have probably 70, 80 outside pass rushers playing probably 30, 40% or more. 
And we have somebody signed in the second tier of free agents who's in the top 10 in sacks the following season. Uh, that and undrafted free agents. These are both places you can get players that can make a difference without using up assets. And when I say assets, I'm talking about draft picks and cap room. And, you know, there's only 22 starters. If you find just one of those, that's 5% of your team. If you find two of those, that's 10% of your team. That can really, really make a difference. And uh, especially as teams, you know, we start to see the quarterbacks that are getting paid so much money. How can we win with a really expensive quarterback? You better be exploiting the markets we're talking about. The second tier free agency, the undrafted free agents, the late draft picks. You've got to have some hits there. And then you can still win a Super Bowl with a quarterback making $40 million a year. But if you're not taking advantage of those markets that are very team friendly, it's going to be very hard to win with a really expensive quarterback. Can you tell when a team is panicking in free agency? And I mean, and I guess I'm looking at like a Jacksonville because they're spending, they spend a ton of money right away. Do you look yeah. at that as strategy or, or panic or how do you view that? Uh, mistake. Okay. <laughs> so we could decide whether it was a panic mistake or not, but a mistake. I mean, you know, listen, there's a long history. Um, and if you spend the time studying, and it was one of the things I did because I felt kind of guiding the philosophy of how to build the team was part of my job. And, you know, when I was at the Eagles was looked upon in, in that way. <clears throat> you know, coaches, I mean, Bill Belichick won five games in his first year as head coach in New England. Andy Reid won five games in his first year as a head coach, you know, in Philadelphia. Uh, Bill Parcells at the Giants won three games his first year. You know, Sean McDermott looked like a mistake after his first year as a head coach. So I, I just don't understand the notion of going all in, and I'm exaggerating that term a little bit, in the first year of a new administration. Um, what I'd like to do if I'm building a team is make a little progress in year one because we want to get people to believe we're on the right track and we want to make it more desirable place for free agents to possibly sign and possibly hire coaches to come and feel really secure about where they're coming. In year two, I want to get a little bit more aggressive and start to lay more of the foundation to what I think are the most important areas. By year three, as I said earlier, we're talking about Ron, I should be able to demonstrate what, the, what they've done in Jacksonville, for example, is the money that they're going to need in year three to keep the good players they have and start to re-sign the draft picks they're hoping that they're hitting on at a higher rate they're spending in year one. Right. And if you want to show a big improvement from year one to year two, you do what Jacksonville's doing. They'll win a lot more games this year than they did last year. And they'll be applauded for it and people will think they're on the right track. But history says, and by the way, I don't say this is it's absolute. There are exceptions to this. But history says your best chance of winning is to gradually in year one and two add pieces, especially young pieces that can still be there in year three, four, and five. And then when you get to like the third year, now you're starting to really get aggressive about trying to move up the ladder within the league. So for me, they've both overpaid some of the players they signed and they're relying way, way too much on free agency and too early for that improvement, which will be good for 2022. But when we start looking at where they should be in 2024, it's gonna be a lot harder for them to succeed at that point. D Devontae Adams, what'd you think of that one real quick? You know, I'm, I'm surprised like everybody else, we were all under an impression that turned out not to be true about how bad he wants to be in Green Bay, how matched him and, and Rogers were. That said, I'm not in the school that the Packers screwed this up. Um, listen, in a perfect world, Adams would have been happy, signed a contract, everything good to go, let's go forward. Um, but I don't rule out the possibility that they can take the $20 million in cap and cash that they now have, plus a first and second round pick and actually be better than they would. I mean, I'll just give a hypothetical for me. If they went out and signed the Jarvis Landry tomorrow, use that first round draft pick on a wide receiver, have to be right about the selection, obviously, and then sign like a tight end like Hooper. So I've got Landry, a first round pick, and Hooper. I'm as good or better than when I had Adams in my mind. Now, I'm running a different offense. It's not as targeted towards a difference making wide receiver. It's more of a diversified offense. Um, and by the way, they have two very good running backs. So I'm not worried at all that the Packers are still in a position where they can have an exceptionally good offense and maybe keep a few other players on defense that help that defensive side keep up with the offense. So I think it'd be interesting to watch. I actually think in hindsight, and I'm betting on the GM here making the right selections with the assets that he got, but I think in hindsight, we're going to actually think that the Green Bay Packers made the right move here, even though at the moment the narrative is, you know, the Packers screwed this up and what a great move by the Raiders. Um, the Raiders have a very short window with a new coach now, and the Packers at least have the opportunity to more than replace Adams. And I don't say that with any disrespect to him. I agree that he's 
the best and the top couple of best wide receivers in the league. But if you give me those three players, a Jarvis Landry type player, a first round draft pick and a, and a better upgrade at tight end, I'm, I'm not worried at all that that offense can score a lot of points. Joe, I appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you very much. No, my pleasure. Good being with you, John. Hey, everybody. It's John Kine. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, and I'll continue to bring you guests who provide excellent insight into the Washington Commanders. And while you're here, check out the other terrific content on the Empire Media Network, including Inside the Cap with Joel Corey and All's Caps with Steve Wino and former Washington Capitol Carl Alsner. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button. Thank you.